welcome, welcome everyone to the 96th annual United Way of Greater Plymouth County meeting, annual meeting and campaign celebration. You don't maybe know this, but you are actually the program. It is because of you that our United Way does what it does as successfully as it has done it. And so we thank you for that. My name is Dennis Carmen, the president and CEO of the United Way of Greater Plymouth County, celebrating my 12th year at the United Way into the next year. And uh, it has been a blessing uh, every day. So I thank you for that opportunity, that honor. Um, we have a couple changes in our program that I want to alert you to. Our chief volunteer officer, the chairman of our board and the chairman of our United Way campaign, Mr. John Doyle from UPS is unfortunately not well today. Now I have to tell you how UPS works. You at UPS are expected to be there every day. Are my UPSers here? Where are my UPS folks? Every day, no matter what happens, you're supposed to be there. So John showed up for work even though he claims it was like he swallowed razor blades this morning. His throat is on fire, he can't speak. I imagine that he's waving his arms around and giving directions nonetheless, but he will not be with us. So fortunately, our vice chair, uh, Lori Maker, uh, is going to sub in for him, and we are ecstatic for that. So thank you on such short notice, Lori. We will, we'll go from there. Yeah, uh, thank you. It does deserve a round. The first wonderful thing we get to do is I'm going to invite you, if you are able and so inclined, to join us for the National Anthem, Nikki Mead Draves, who is both a friend and a colleague. She works with the Good Samaritan folks at Stewart Healthcare. She is a wonderful singer, and she will lead us in the National Anthem. So again, if you're so inclined, please join us in our National Anthem. You know that was killer, right? What you did, shh, nobody saw, nobody heard, come on. Thank you, Nikki, that was wonderful. You know, Nikki and I have been talking about her doing the National Anthem for our United Way for years. I don't know why it took us that long, as she has such a lovely voice and does such great things for Good Samaritan and, uh, and the good folks at Steward Healthcare. So thank you, Nikki. Um, just before uh, we do, the invocation. Uh, I want to share with you, uh, if I can make sure my notes don't disappear on me, share with you a parable. And uh, you know, I guess I'm not going to step away from the microphone. Uh, some of you might have heard this in different ways, in different places, but there was a Dr. Irvin Yalom who wrote a book called The Theory and Practice of Group Psychotherapy. I know that doesn't sound really exciting. Uh, but I taught a course on substance abuse counseling for Stonehill College a number of years back, 
and I ran into this was our textbook, and there was this terrific story, and it's, it's referred to by different cultures in different ways, but Dr. Yalom tells the story this way. There was a Hasidic, a his, a his, a and I knew I was going to not say that word right, story where a rabbi had a conversation with the Lord about heaven and hell. And the Lord said, let me show you hell. And he walked the rabbi into this large room, and there were people who were famished and unhappy uh, and really looking sad. And there was a large circular table, and in the center of the circular table, there was this delicious pot of stew. And it was so delicious that it made the rabbi's mouth water. And unfortunately, there were also these long-handled spoons, much longer than this, and while the spoons allowed the individuals to reach the pot and get a spoonful of the delicious stew, they were too long and didn't allow the people around the table to eat. And so they were in much distress. It was very, very sad and tragic. And the rabbi, recognizing that these folks were truly suffering, bowed his head in compassion. Then the Lord said, let me show you heaven. And he walked the rabbi into a room that was identical to the first, the same circular table, the same large pot of stew in the center, the same long-handled spoons. But in this room, the people were happy and well-nourished. And of course, the rabbi looked at the Lord in confusion. And the Lord said, it is simple but it takes a certain skill. You see, the people in this room have learned how to feed each other. Before I offer an invocation, I want you to look around the room and I want you to look at the smiles and the twinkling eyes and the intelligence and the talent of all of the people in this room and recognize that you are all partners in the process that we have of trying to set a larger table for our neighbors in need. So let us bow our heads, please. Dear Lord, however we conceive you, let us recognize that there are great needs in this world. There are people who are hungry. There are people who are homeless. There are youth who need direction. There are elders who need to be cared for. We have men and women and families who have developmental challenges and physical challenges, and all of them, Lord, need to be taken care of. Lord, let us also recognize that you have given us enough resources to take care of them. But we are challenged in order to be creative, in order to use the resources you've given to make sure that people don't go hungry, to make sure that people have homes to live in, to make sure that our youth have good direction, to make sure that our elders are being taken care of. Lord, you have given us the abilities. You have given us each other. Let us help us to form creative partnerships to make a difference in our world, Lord. Help us to set that bigger table to make sure no one in our community is going to go without being taken care of. And we all say, in, in, in whatever faith perspective we come from, we all say together, Amen. Let's say, Amen. Let's say it nice and loud like we mean it. Amen. amen. Brothers and sisters, I still don't hear you out there. Let's hear an amen. amen. Now that's more like it. I like it. Very nice. Thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. You are gathered here because you really are the show and the program. And though we have a lot of good things in store for you, and I can tell you there is so much hope at the end of this program. And we, uh, I am excited to hear from Mr. Kane, who will provide us with some real inspiration toward the end, but we've got a lot to do. Right now, what I would like to do is ask to come to the podium our Vice Chair of the Board of Directors of the United Way of Greater Plymouth County, Lori Maker. Good afternoon, friends. We are so grateful all of you have taken time out of your busy schedules to be here with us today to celebrate all the good work that we've done in our communities over the past year. We couldn't do it alone, and you all know this. But today, first, I'd like to recognize our sponsors for this event. 
Bridgewater State University has hosted this event for the past six years, and we are truly grateful for your support in this initiative. I'd like to invite President Fred Clark up to the podium to say a few words. Thank you very much. Welcome to Bridgewater State University. Larry said, keep it to three minutes. Dennis said, take as much time as you want. <laughs> so I just wanted to welcome all of you. I see a lot of our friends and colleagues and partners in the room. I want to thank our, our Bridgewater team. Our Bridgewater team is on this side and standing in the back. Thank you for making this happen. And uh, we love to host this event. Uh, it's the sixth year, as uh, Laurie just mentioned. We're honored to be able to help you. I, I just wanted to mention, just a couple weeks ago, <clears throat> we congratulated 2,500 students that graduated from Bridgewater State and walked across the stage. Three different commencements. I shook every hand. My hand is still uh, unusable at the moment. But I was, I was thinking about this lunch and thinking about all of them. And shaking their hands is such a moving experience for any of us that are at this university. They might have been coming out of our school of social work, they might have been sociologists, or they might have been educators or special educators, communication disorders graduates, psychology graduates, public administration graduates, or any other uh, of a field of programs that we have. But that doesn't tell the story of our students or of this region. What I thought about when they went across that stage is the service they provided, not only to this institution, but to this region as well through a children's physical developmental clinic, or an inclusive concurrent enrollment program, or for at-risk youth, hundreds of at-risk youth, youth across this region, or working with um, students one-on-one -on -one to tutor them, or providing 24,000 K-12 students a STEM opportunity on this campus last year, and so many other forms of, of service as well through our community service center, thousands and thousands of hours provided to this region, and tens of thousands of dollars raised by our students to support causes like the United Way as well. I couldn't be more proud of our students and of our graduates. <clears throat> and I also think about the challenges our students overcome. Our students come from incredibly difficult backgrounds in some cases, the very average students in other cases, but what they've overcome to walk across that stage is really remarkable. We have on this campus homeless youth. We have students that have come from school on wheels. We have students that work two and three jobs. So when they walk across that stage, it's saying something about their determination uh, for themselves and about their pursuit of their dreams as well. But I also, I not just focused on our students and what they've overcome, but where they're going. And, and they're going to places like the United Way or like the organizations that the United Way supports. So as I think about the work of the United Way and I think about the purpose for today, setting a bigger table, and I love that, by the way, because I think the table gets smaller sometimes in the United States of America, but not in this region because of all of you. The table needs to be bigger. And at Bridgewater, and I hope everyone agrees, we will be judged in history by those that we include and never by those that we exclude. And that's what everyone in this room understands, that we need to include uh, folks to help this society and to be a stronger nation and to be judged by history in the right way. I want to thank the United Way for what it does to support us at Bridgewater in our mission. And I want to particularly thank your leader, Dennis Carmen, for what he does uh, to represent the United Way. We were very happy to give him a Distinguished Service Award at commencement a couple years ago. Uh, for himself and for the United Way. He always has a song in his heart. I love that about him. I don't see a stool or a guitar or a lamp, so the song is going to have to stay in his heart. I think we'd all think that that's probably okay, but I just I want to thank him for what he does and all of you for what you do and Team uh, United Way for what you do as well. Welcome to Bridgewater, and again, thank you for, uh, for having us. We have three additional event sponsors, uh, Bridgewater Savings Bank, and Lynch and Lynch Attorney at Law, and National Grid. Uh, somebody's not here. Yes, Joe Cardinal from National Grid. Okay. I'd like to invite Peter Della Russo from Bridgewater Savings Bank to stand and be recognized, and Attorney Andrew Lynch from Lynch and Lynch, please. Thank you. Thank you to 
to both of you and your organizations for your support today. All right. Again, with, uh, with Chair John Doyle not here, I've got a couple additional things that I wanted to do. But before I go too much farther, uh, I wanted to recognize our dedicated staff. Uh, and, and by staff, some of you may not realize this, we have one of those best kept secrets in the community that beyond our United Way's traditional campaign staff and support folks, we have community connections of Brockton and the Family Center. We hold the contract with the Department of Children and Families and we have a number of partners who help support the terrific work that they do there. So what I would like to do, and I'm hoping I don't miss people, but if I'm going to, I'm going to ask each of these people to stand if you're in attendance. I know most of them are. Our Director of Finance is Cindy Gillis. She can stand to be recognized. Our Director, our Director of Resource Development is Connie Hunt. And she's already standing. Okay. Our Director of Community Relations and Marketing is Kim Allen. Our development associate, Joe Travers, who is also standing already, but... Darby Perkins, who is our finance assistant and resource, uh, resource, human resource assistant, Darby. <laughs> Melinda Nealon, who is the director of the Community Connections of Brockton and the Family Center, Melinda. Maria Brennan, who I believe is not here, is the coordinator of the Family Center. She's relatively new to our family, as are some of our other additions. But uh, she's, some of them are at trainings. I want you to know that they would, not, they would be here if it weren't for something really important like that. Uh, we also have some community resource specialists and school liaisons. And so we have, and I'm going to list these in no particular order, just hoping I don't forget any of them. We have Claudia Coonan, who is, is, is not here, I don't believe. Ma Marilyn Sackline is okay, and we have new to our staff Vivian Webster, who I believe is at a training as well. We have Allison Lopes. We have Yannick Matthew, who is our administrative assistant at the Family Center. She is here, Yannick. We have brand new to our staff Jensen Denoise. And Melinda, have I forgotten anyone? On, on site, Inez, and I'm sorry, Inez's last name, I only know Inez. Figarello is also on site. It's, I have to tell you that, that, that the com campaign staff work tirelessly all around the year, and the family center staff also taking care of folks. And, and recently, we've had an influx of families from Puerto Rico who are without resources, without connections. And what the Family Center and Community Connections does is basically that. So while United Way staff are out there trying to promote the United Way and our terrific community partners who are in the room, um, we've got a lot of people in the Family Center who are working at serving some of those needs directly and families who are coming forward for a lot of services to be connected in the community. So, they do a tremendous job. Please give them all another round of applause. <laughs> At this time, I'd also like to ask to stand all of our board of directors. These are the folks who volunteer day in and day out to govern our board, to make sure we're going the right path. Would our board of directors please stand and be recognized? We talk every year about doubling their salary, which is really no problem. You know, multiples of zero are kind of easy and it works out pretty well. Thank you. We do have several of our board members who, in spite of the fact that it is an incredible amount of, of hard work and occasional fun, that we have board members, we have term limits at the United Way of Greater Plymouth County, and so that you can be a board member for a three-year term and you could, you could stay for two consecutive three-year terms. 
Once you finish six years, you do have to step off the board for at least a year. And we have three departing members who have reached that, that plateau. And I'm going to be asking them individually to come up. But they are Barbara Calgill from Rockland Trust, David, David Kindy from Mark Johnson Associates Marketing, and then our board treasurer, Kevin White from Bloom Shapiro, are, are all finishing out here. Now, they are going to, they don't know this, they're going to receive not only an autographed copy of our speaker's book, which you're going to all want by the time you leave here, but secondly, we have a special book for each of them, so I'm going to ask them, hoping that the books are here. Yes, they are. Barbara Calgill, you are here. Can you come forward, please? <laughs> These were all chosen for specific reasons, and I don't want to have you misunderstand this. Oh, okay. Roberta's going to come. You're going to have to explain this then to Roberta. It's going to be difficult, because the title of the book we're giving to Barbara is called, We're Going to Need More Wine. And the, and the author of the book is Gabrielle Union. You like that? Union. Gabrielle is an outspoken person. She has shared her own story of being sexually abused, and she has stood up as an eloquent person against the, the terrible uh, things that happen when people abuse women. And so that is for Barbara, as well as oops, a copy of our authors, a signed copy of our authors. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Sorry Roberta's. she couldn't be here No today. worries. She's busy doing things. We understand this. Um, thank you. I believe, unless I'm mistaken, that Mr. Dave Kindy is also not here. Um, and the book that we got for him, David, as you may or may not know, writes fe feature articles. And he was lucky enough to have interviewed David McCullough. And any of you have read history, have not missed David McCullough. He writes some of the best biographies of some of our presidents and some of the best history around. So we decided to get David Dan Rather's What Unites Us. And it's a really unique perspective on all of the good things, why so many of us use the title of patriot and really mean why we love this country. So that's something for David and, and again, a signed copy of, of uh, Mr. Kane's book. Last but not least, you're going to love this, our treasurer, Kevin White from Bloom Shapiro, is also stepping down. And we've gotten a book that's titled The Wisdom of Finance. Now, what it, what it is, though, it's a book that makes clear that finance is not just about the numbers. There's a humanity in it. No matter how many things people say, bad things about the finance world, this is about yeah, humanity yeah, as well thank as you. finance. Perfect. Thank you. Kevin, thank you so much. Oh, yeah. oh, yes. Thank you. All right, and now just another piece of announcement more than anything else is our board of directors has done two important things. Our governance committee and our board have voted in three new board members, and they are, I'm going to list them again in no particular order, Jim Smith from Rockland Trust, if you could stand up. <laughs> Mary Furo who is from Good Samaritan and Stewart Healthcare. And not able to be with us today is Michael McCarthy, who is coming from, to us from Eastern Bank. So thank you for agreeing to be our new board member. And then finally, I'm going to just announce that all of the board officers are returning to their duties, with one exception. As Kevin White is rolling off our board, we needed a new board treasurer, and Mr. Joe Camise has stepped forward to do that for us. But our board members are Chair John Doyle from UPS, who will continue as our board chairman, Vice Chair Lori Maker, right? And, and, and the new company, my, my, Moran, Environmental Recovery, correct? And, and Lori is, is, is a communications and marketing specialist as well. A lot of years at Massasoit College, many of you know uh, her from that role. Uh, our secretary of the board clerk is uh, Heather Arigi from the Brockton Public Schools. Uh, and then we have, uh, what am I blanking on? Um, which makes our immediate past chair then still be Mr. Stephen Hall, 
formerly of National Grid and Control Point. So thank you. They all deserve a round of applause for their service, please. Must look kind of weird for me to do that, huh? I was just thinking about that. You can laugh, that's okay. <laughs> I felt it was kind of weird hiding behind the podium too, but I needed to refer to my notes because we're moving to the next segment of our program. And uh, while well, I'm pretty sure I remember this, we this year have a special set of awards called the Community Life Saver Awards. And I'll explain that only after the last and the third recipient. But at this time, I would like to ask uh, to come forward Melinda Nealon, again, the Director of Community Connections at Brockton and the Family Center, for the announcement of our first award. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today um, and to do the first induction of this award that we are adding to our program year, and we hope to continue it every year to come. I'm going to start with a reading um, and a hope that we see from this person every year and every day in the eight years that she has been involved with our organization, whether it be through paid employment or through volunteerism. And so this amazing woman is what we call a developer. She sees the potential in others very often. In fact, the potential is all she sees. She views in every individual the true essence of their full form. On the contrary to what many of us do, where we identify the challenges and the struggles that we experience in our day-to-day -day life, she is the one who sees hope. When she interacts with others, her goal is to help them experience success. She looks for the ways to challenge them to grow. She looks for the opportunity to devise interesting experiences that can stretch them and help them. And all the while, she is the one on the lookout for the signs of growth. She identifies new behaviors that are modified. She sees the slight improvements in every skill. She holds the glimpse of excellence and identifies the flow where previously were only steps of haltering fate. For she sees the small increments that are invisible to others, and she identifies the clear signs of potential being realized. These signs of growth in others are her fuel. They bring her the strength and satisfaction of a lifetime. Over time, many will seek her out for her help and encouragement because they see on some level they know that her help is the helpfulness that will help them that is genuine and that is fulfilling both for her and the people she serves so it is with my great pleasure that this year we would like to invite fabiola hippolyte to the stage to be honored Fabiola, we would like to honor you with our first Community Lifesaver Award. I'll give her a minute because this is a complete surprise. Um, many of you in the room are community partners. Fabiola needs no introduction. Um, because in her sleepless nights and her many days of community engagement, she's facilitated activities for the youth at Brockton High School. She's facilitated um, conversational English for our Haitian-speaking community. She's advocated at the, the State House for equal rights for undocumented immigrants. She's worked through her own citizenship, citizenship journey here in America. Um, and pursued higher education, support, and resource building for all those that she encounters. Even today, as she is no longer an employee with us here at the Family Center, she continues to donate her time 
in development of the South Shore Leadership Conference and has started Babby's Faith, an ongoing support group for those impacted by cancer. So it is with great pleasure that we invite her here to honor her today. I'm so, oh my God. The whole time I'm like, why, why did she invite me? <laughs> why do you keep asking? I know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. This means the world to me. You mean the world to me. For always believing in me, supporting me. She's the kind of person where I have an idea. This is what I want to do. And I can always call her. She's like, okay, how do we support you? How do we connect the dots? So I thank you. Even when I wanted to start the group, she's like, listen, you have a space. Whatever you need, just, I got you. Just that, thank you. You're thank welcome. you, thank you. I'm speechless, I'm sorry. I don't even know what to say. Thank you. Yeah, there's not gonna be a dry eye in the house by the time we're done, right? That's awesome. Our second Community Lifesaver Award uh, comes from a different area, but nonetheless uh, important in terms of life saving. I first met uh, my colleague, Bob Hollis, as a Rotary member. And my expectations, uh, I just didn't know him well, but I knew he was the head of a, a life insurance, an insurance company, rather, Hollis Insurance in Plymouth. I knew he was a patron of the arts. I knew that he was a drummer who wanted to learn to play guitar and is doing that. And all of those things were terrific things to know about a person. But what really was both sad and amazing to me is that Bob, a year and a half ago, lost his son to a heroin addiction. And it wasn't what you'd think is the normal course of things, because you hear a lot of stories about addictions and the loss of life. But Bob's son was actually in two years of recovery when he relapsed once for one night and then lost his life. But Bob's family, instead of retreating, instead of turning away, instead of hiding, made it very publicly known. As many of you know, you read obituaries and they don't really tell the story when lives get lost, when it happens to be in a tragic way or in a way of something that we have a lot of stigma attached to. But Bob and his family decided that their son was very open about his struggles with addiction and his recovery. And so what he and his family chose to do was to turn that around and do something positive, to make sure that there were additional supports for people who are struggling with addiction. So to open the Plymouth Recovery Center, to raise dollars and awareness, not just for another additive treatment program, because we have some treatment programs, but a treatment program that talked about peers reaching out to peers, people who understand what it's like, people who know how important it is to both educate our community and to try to prevent these tragedies from happening. Because yes, it's in the news and the opioid addiction's in the news, but let's be, be honest and, and acknowledge that addiction has been with us for a long, long, long time. And we've lost a lot of dear, loved people. And they are our sons, our daughters, our brothers, our sisters, our husbands, our wives, our girlfriends, and our boyfriends. We shouldn't be losing these lives. It's tragic. It's, it's a loss of talent. It's a loss of life. And from my perspective, God didn't mean for us to lose lives this way. So our second Community Lifesaver Award, because that's truly what Bob and his family and his friends are doing with the Plymouth Recovery Center, is come forward, Mr. Hollis, to receive your Community Lifesaver Award. This award really goes to a community that responded too. I, I often say we were the ones, we were the catalysts, but we had a whole community around Plymouth that responded in such a way that we were, are the only privately funded recovery center in the state. All the other 10 ones are uh, funded by the state. We came together because we realized we need one place where someone can go if they had questions about 
where can they go for help or just to get, get some, some support. Secondly, the biggest one in our story, as you heard, our son was two and a half years clean. He had a job. He was doing great. Why did he go back? We, we don't know that, but it really gave us an appreciate, appreciation for how hard it is. So we knew we had to have a place where people can come and have a community of recovery for at least five years after they come out of the treatment centers, because that's what it, really what it takes. So with that, uh, this really goes out to our community who came together, and we've been together open almost a year now. We've, we have 200 people coming through the doors every month. We've uh, referred 30 people to treatment, uh, and it's just going great, supporting not only those in recovery, but families and so forth, too. So thank you for the recognition, but this goes out to the whole town of Plymouth. Thanks. Our last Community Lifesaver Award is going out to our governor and our lieutenant governor. And I have to tell you that the name for this award came about in, a, in, a, in quite a strange way. If you note this picture of myself and the lieutenant governor holding lifesavers. Yes, it actually came about because when I first met the governor, and it was actually one of our funded partners, Father Bills and Mainspring, had a forum where they invited the governor to talk about the need for housing. And I was able to come up to the governor, let him know that while he was not in fact from the party that I'm part of, I did vote for him and appreciated his efforts, I happened to reach into my pocket and have a lifesaver. And I handed it to the governor. Okay, pretty non-important thing to do. I happened to run into the governor at a Metro Chamber of South event not too long after this one. And he was speaking, and I was impressed as always because he was reaching across the table to say, we need to solve our Commonwealth's problems by not worrying about partisanship, but about partnership. I reached into my pocket, and lo and behold, I had another lifesaver wrapped up. I handed him this lifesaver. I will tell you right now that the governor looked a little strangely at me, thinking, who is this whack job who is handing me lifesavers? Since that time, every time I've come close to approaching the governor, there's been a security force that's, that's been out there. But I, I actually know that the story was interesting. It continues because I was at another event. Father Bills happened to be opening a, 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 a housing project up in Brockton that they were very proud of, and the lieutenant governor was there. So I told the lieutenant governor my story, trying to make sure that the governor didn't think I was a whack job. Her eyes lit up and she said, how did you know? He loves lifesavers, and I have to have a, a ton of them on my desk to make sure that he has them when he wants them. So I thought, okay, this is terrific. So I was invited to an annual meeting of the Conway Realty Company, and the main speaker was the Lieutenant Governor. So I took the opportunity to bring two bags of lifesavers. I said, one of these is for you, and the other is for the governor. So it, it occurred to me that what a great idea to call an award a community lifesaver award, because that's what Fabiola, that's what Bob Hollis is, that's what the lieutenant and the lieutenant go and the governor are all about, is saving lives by having creative partnerships and realizing none of us can do it alone. We were fortunate when we were trying to get the governor to attend this meeting and the lieutenant governor, their schedules didn't allow them to be here, but they were kind enough to record a message specifically for us. So without any further ado, the governor and the lieutenant governor. Partnership with so many community-based organizations to deliver 
uh, quality of care and service to the families and individuals within your region. I do a lot of work at the community level. I think a lot about the safety net across our commonwealth and indeed in Plymouth County, your safety net is very strong due to a large part of your efforts as uh, members of the United Way. So as the governor says, when you find something that's working, keep doing more of it. So congratulations to you as well. Keep doing more of what you're doing. Hope you all have a great day and a great summer, and I'm sure at some point in our travels we'll be in your neighborhood, and we have, hope we have a chance to thank you personally. Thank you. It was a terrific message. We really appreciate it. And we also appreciate our friends at the Plymouth area uh, cable TV access who helped us record that. Also take this opportunity to thank our friends at the Brockton community access who typically tape the annual meeting. So thank you all for doing that. Thank you for the people who are saving lives every day. At this point in time, it is my great pleasure to reintroduce our vice chair, Lori Maker, and the development staff to talk about some of the terrific awards that we're giving out to some of your, the best companies and the best people out there who made our United Way campaign a success this year, Lori. Hello again. So it's that time of the program where we have the opportunity to thank all of you. Thank our community partners and all the companies out there who have supported us throughout the past year to achieve our goals. And I'm so excited to be able to celebrate this with you and to welcome Pawnee here. Uh, I know most of you have met her at this point, I'm sure, uh, to help me give out these awards today. <laughs> The Circle of Caring United Way Campaign Awards. For the largest corporate gift, we have Harbor One Bank. I'd like to welcome up Jim Blake. The largest campaign increase, Lynch and Lynch. I'd like to welcome up Andrew Lynch. Yes, to welcome on behalf of John Doyle.
and the Circle of Caring Chairman's Award, Enterprise Holdings, I'd like to welcome up Andrea Kershaw. celebrates campaigns whose long-standing support has resulted in achieving and exceeding the $1 million in annual workplace giving. This is dedicated, this is a dedicated special group whose commitment to the United Way is truly humbling. Please join us in congratulating the following million dollar circle companies. Rockland Trust, Chris Olson, and President and CEO. President and CEO. when you have somebody who's not here, you have too much of, of, of the president and CEO. But the good thing is I get to pass off the buck quickly. Um, our Courage Award is given to those people who've taken advantage of an initiative of the United Way, whether we fund it or directly running it. And for this year's Courage Award, I'm going to ask once again if uh, Melinda Nealon will come to the podium and explain who, who our award is like. Courage Award is going to be given to two parents who recently graduated from our Parenting Journey program. For those of you who do not know, we offer a variety of parent skill building courses at the Family Center. Um, each program runs either 12 to 14 weeks or twice a week for six to seven weeks. All the curriculum builds upon the, the first lesson builds upon the second, second on the third. And throughout the course, parents are being asked to explore how they learned their parenting techniques what things they value, what things they're struggling with as parents. Um, and they're really challenging themselves and, and each other to grow and develop and enhance their parenting skills for the well-being of their children and families. And so this year, we've asked um, Josh and Jess to join us so we can celebrate them. And I'd like you guys to come up here, and then I'd like to... give them some breathing room um, because we are most proud of this couple. They were the first couple that we had attend our parenting class together and to graduate. And um, then throughout it, we were able to observe their strength, their resilience, their humility in, in sharing the successes and the challenges that they experienced as parents. Um, they engaged with their other um, peers in the room and all of our staff at the Family Center really recognized very quickly that this is a couple invested in the well-being of their children, their families, and their community. Um, before the classes even ended, Josh was asking which class he could sign up for next. Um, and we saw them grow as individuals, as parents, and as a couple. 
And they made comments throughout the program like, what are we, got, what are we gonna do without you guys? We communicate better. <laughs> we're more excited. We have better plans when we're spending time with our children. They worked on nutrition. They worked on communication. They worked on having positive parenting time in the midst of three, three littles, having, managing the day-to-day -day life of three little children, which sometimes can be hard. And so we just want to celebrate them. I want to share a little bit about what I saw them grow most in. Um, for those of you who don't know, I am someone that really harnesses the power of strengths and abilities and identifying people's gifts and call in the world. And what I saw this young couple develop most was self-assurance in our program. So I'm going to read a little bit about that. So self-assurance is similar to self-confidence. In the deepest part of you, you have faith in your strength. You know you are able, able to take risks, able to meet new challenges, able to stake a claim, most important, able to deliver. But self-assurance is more than just self-confidence. Blessed with the theme of self-assurance, you have the confidence not only in your abilities, but in your judgment. When you look at the world, you know that your perspective is unique and distinct. And because no one else sees exactly what you see, you know that no one can make decisions for you. No one can tell you what to think. They can only guide. They can suggest, but you alone have the authority to form conclusions, make decisions, and act in the best interest of your family. The authority is this final accountability for living your best self, your life. Life does not intimidate you. On the contrary, it feels natural. No matter what the situation is, you seem to know what the right decision is. This theme lends you an aura of certainty. Unlike many, you are not easily swayed by someone else's argument. Particularly with three children, you can be pulled in a lot of directions. <laughs> You're not going to be persuaded anymore. No matter how persuasive they may be, this self-assurance may be quiet, quiet, or loud, depending on your and others' themes. But it's solid. It is strong. Like the keel of a ship, it withstands many different pressures. And you, both of you, it will keep you on course. So may you continue your journey in self-assurance. Thank you so much. Okay, this is where I do my, my lame Steve Martin impression and say, I forgot. Um, the very end of our, our community, uh, our, our campaign awards, uh, we are excited this year to announce that Mr. John Doyle from UBS, who has been in a dual role of our chairman of our board as well as the chair of the campaign, he's stepping back from that role and we're very excited to have a seasoned veteran uh, Mr. Bill McCann from Wells Fargo Advisors, who's stepping forward to become next year's United Way campaign chair. Bill has done this for a record three consecutive times in the past when I first came to United Way. He's been the chairman of our board. Uh, he is part of an organization that nationally, and let's not wrestle out in this room here, but between UPS and Wells Fargo, they wrestle for the title of the company that's most supportive of United Way. So we're very excited because Wells Fargo has announced a 40% increase in its community giving. We're certainly hoping that Bill can break, bring home the bacon in terms of that, right? But if he would come forward, we're literally, we want to pass the torch, Bill. Stand over here. Stand over here. Now, we, we, we haven't rehearsed this, but we want, we've got some music for this too, and we're hoping that comes up. Is that, there you, you hear this? this? For those of you who are unschooled about this, this is the theme song for Chariots of Fire. Okay? So now I'm going to do my very best slow motion live impression. <laughs> Two words. <laughs> 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 
Thank you again. I'm honored and humbled. Uh, very uh, interested in working with Dennis and the, the United Way again. I really feel like I look around and when I get on the, the pity pot of life, I, I look around and, and I feel like I come across people who certainly have things far worse than I've ever had them. And, uh, and I always feel like, hey, I, I, I could do more. And uh, so when Connie asked me to be this year's campaign chair, I, I said it with a re resounding yes. Um, I'm happy to do it, and uh, but I'll need all your help. So don't duck me. You know, <laughs> when you see me calling you, uh, no. But thank you so much. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. It's a great organization. I, I, I'm happy to be back in the fold. Thank you. You can. Bill said, can I keep the torch? As <laughs> long as you blaze it brightly, Bill, and can bring home that bacon, I'm telling you, you can. Thank you so much. We have one last award before, the, the, before our speaker, and uh, it's another surprise recipient, a person who doesn't know. Every year, the United Way gives a Community Spirit Award, which is our in most important award for volunteerism. And every other year it seems to go to our outgoing uh, United Way chair because it's such an arduous role. There's a whole lot you have to do as the chairman of our board. But every other year we're able to reach out to someone who isn't necessarily directly connected. Someone who may be in a role in the nonprofit world but gives much more of their time. And in this case, this person has always impressed me with being the model of what it means to reach beyond your organizational boundary, beyond your geographic boundary, and to be giving and cooperative and collaborative in the community. Um, there was a story, and she, she should be able to, to know who she is when I tell you this story, but there was an organization that in locally, one of our community partners, it was actually the Boys and Girls Club of Brockton, that had a challenge in terms of getting food bank, food from the food bank in Boston, because you know you have to drive in and drive back out. This person volunteered their driver and their truck in order to make sure that that organization also got food from the Boston Food Bank. In addition to that, this person has also reached out, happens to run one of the county FEMA boards, has always been willing to reach out to us to provide technical assistance, but recently heard that a couple of the organizations in an area outside of ours were not getting their funding and it wasn't a timely submission, and she offered to go down and meet and provide technical assistance. To be honest with you, that's the kind of person that I would want running my nonprofit organization. And so it is with great pleasure and a great honor for us to ask Beth Chambers from Catholic Charity South to come forward to receive this year's Community Spirit Award. absolutely positively a surprise. I looked at, at our table and saw some of our, our supervisors and development people here. It's like, what are you doing down here? Um, had no idea till just when, when he mentioned the Boys and Girls Club. Um, being from Catholic Charities and, and wanting to help others and, and seeing any, another agency in need, that's, that's part of what we do. And I, and I look forward to doing more of it and I'm honored to be a part of, of the United Way of Greater Summit County. Thank you. We had a good suggestion. The gentleman from uh, Bridgewater State, who is their photographer, is a great guy, great organization, great you know to work for the, the Bridgewater State. What I want you to do is, first of all, lift your spoons up because we'd like a few pictures of the spoons, right? So now, what, what I'm going to ask you to do is don't wave them so we can take a nice picture, but smile. All right. Now here's the second thing I'm going to ask you to do. Okay. I'm going to ask you now, you don't have to put it in someone's mouth, but I want you to pretend you're feeding someone else at your table. Go ahead. This is what it's about. We're supposed to learn to feed each other, right? Feeding each other. Okay. 
<laughs> you guys are terrific. Thank you for doing that. Now, the great part of this next thing is I really don't have to do much of an introduction. I'm going to say the very bare bones of this is Dave Kane is the father of the youngest victim of the Rhode Island nightclub fire. Now that may sound like a, 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 it, it is a tragic thing, but I have to tell you, like everything we've heard today, it's taking tragedy and making it inspirational and providing hope. So without any further ado, I am going to let Mr. Dave Kane describe what he is and his message, and excited to have him here. So many people are here. Yeah.
My uh, our son Chris was in a, in a in a bookstore one day, and he saw a, a book by Robert Brown, who is an international medium from England, and the book was named We Are Eternal. And so he got it for his mom, and it was the only book that helped her. It was the only thing that helped her after the thing he passed. It was the only thing that gave her any solace. And she was sitting in bed one night reading the book, and she got tired. And she put the book on the floor, took her glasses off, put them on the book. The next morning she woke up, she looked down to make sure she didn't step on her glasses, and there was a giant white feather on the book. And she decided, that's it, I'm going to find out what's going on here. And she tried to contact Robert Brown. We wrote to his uh, secretary. And a week later we got a call, and he was going to give us, uh, he was going to give us the first appointment he had in October uh, that year. Which was really good, we were very excited. Except the first weekend in September, I had two heart attacks and renewal bypass surgery. And a month later, I'm on the, I'm on the train going to New York. <laughs> and that wasn't the worst part. The worst part was we get on the train, and my wife says to the conductor, Can we get two seats together? Because he just had open heart surgery. And we went, He said, You had open heart surgery? I had open heart surgery. <laughs> Uh, great. He said, how you doing? I said, good. He said, are you getting exercise? I said, yeah, yeah. He said, are you eating good? I said, yeah. He said, have you had the depression yet? <laughs> I said, no. He said, good, you shouldn't. He pointed at my wife. He said, you got a lot to live for. And he pointed at my wife. He said, you got all the daughter. <laughs> you son of a... <laughs> uh, so we get to New York, and we get to, to Park Street, and we go to his apartment. Robert Brown's apartment, and for an hour he told us stuff we couldn't possibly, he couldn't possibly know. He told us stuff we didn't know. He told us when he was standing. Months later, we saw the video of the fire, and we can see right when Nikki was standing where he said. He told us that Nikki stopped and helped a woman who threw herself on the floor and went back. Three years later, a woman came up to me who survived the fire and told me the same story about him. But then at the end, he looked at me and he said, your son wants me to tell you one more thing. He wants me to tell you that the show must go on. Now what nobody could possibly know, not, not anybody, except my wife and I, is that those were the very last words my son spoke to me. His band was going to open for Great White on Friday night and the fire was on Thursday evening. And he went on Thursday to check out the room. And I, I was giving him a ride to his girlfriend's house on Wednesday. And I found out I wasn't getting much money for the gig. So I was teasing him because our whole family is in show business. We have a son that's a stage director in New York. We have a son that's a San Francisco opera. We have another son that's an actor. And we have Nikki. And so I was teasing him. You don't make a show business. You've got to get your bucks. You do it for free. they will let you. <laughs> and when we got to his girlfriend's house, I said, honey, I didn't mean to pick on you. But I don't know why you sell God's talent so short. And he gave me a hug and a kiss. He said, Dad. Because the show must go on. And Robert Brown told us that. Join in the heart. Happy birthday, Chris. We have four boys, as I mentioned to you. Chris is the oldest, Christian is the oldest, and the youngest is Nikki. They're 10 years apart. And Chris and Nikki were joined really at the heart. You can't imagine. They, Chris was obsessed with videotaping Nikki at every turn. From the time he wore that little 41 to moments before he passes in, in, the, in the movie 41, which is an award-winning documentary about him, you know now why he was, he was obsessed with it. Now we know why, because he was gathering all of this video for the movie that was going to be made. And, and it was really interesting, because he, he videotaped Nikki everywhere, on, in the car, in the house, in the backyard, on stage, in the bathroom. <laughs> and so the year Nikki passed, it came to be Chris's birthday, and Chris asked for a new video camera. So uh, we were going to get him a, I wanted to get him a Sony, because I'm a big spender. Okay, lady, they're $10 more, but you know, I just, just don't. But my wife said, no, we have to get him a Samsung. And I said, why? She, she said, I don't know, he just wants a Samsung. So I get him a Samsung, and we're all in, in the car, going to Bugaloo to have dinner for his birthday. And it was really great because we bought him the camera and now you don't have to wrap presents anymore. And it's great. Just put them in a bag, put a bunch of toilet paper on top. 
And so we're going to Buckaloo Creek, and, and we've got the present, and, and so Chris is going to open his, his box, and he starts to open the box. And I should tell you that every year, when it was Christian's birthday, he let Nikki blow out his candles. Every year, Nikki would blow out his candles. So he stops to open the box and he says to his mom, Mom, I guess this year I have to blow out my own candles. And he opens the box and he takes out the brochure from Samsung, and on the cover of the brochure is a picture. A little boy blowing out the candles on a birthday cake. Is that cool? Do you think that's pretty cool? This is Nikki. Now, this picture was, um, I had to chase a uh, Samsung. It took me six years to chase the picture on the left. Nobody would talk to me at Samsung. They thought they had run my, uh, my son's picture without permission and nobody wanted to pay us. So, <laughs> So I finally got, a, of course, a female executive who caught it, who understood it. And she said to me, Mr. King, I'm going to have the photographer to, uh, call you, but I don't think this is your son. Now, my wife was absolutely convinced that this was Nikki from the uh, Disney cruise we went on. So the photographer called me on the following Tuesday morning at 11.41. And he said, Mr. Kane, this is not your son. He said, we did this shoot in San Diego, but I'm going to send you all the pictures from the shoot so you'll know. And in none of the other pictures does this boy look as much like him as he does in this one. Happy birthday, Chris. Let's sing songs on my great musical carousel. I got to tell you, my son was a buster. He liked to kid around. He liked to laugh and sing. He couldn't stand it if people were not in a good mood. And one night, Chris and his wife were trying to get to sleep, and Nicky was in their room with his guitar, and he said, let's all sing great songs on that musical carousel. Well, the songs he sang had nothing to do with carousel. They were all rude songs that he made up about his brothers. <laughs> And then after he said to Chris, I don't know why I said that, because I don't even know what carousel is about. Well, some of you may know, some of you older ones like me may know that carousel is a musical about a young man who passes and comes back and watches over his family. And the reason I tell you this is because the year that he passed, he came to the Mother's Day. What do you get a mother in the year her son passes? Well, Chris was determined to get the best pass present he could. He didn't care what it cost. He didn't care where he had to go. He didn't care what he had to do. So being the Chris that we know, he went to a flea market. <laughs> and when he got to the flea market, they were playing the theme song from the musical Carousel. So he thought, well, this is a sign. So he goes around and the, the huge flea market goes around and he finally finds what he thinks is the perfect gift. He finds a hand-wound music box that plays a song from Carousel. So on, on Mother's Day morning, he gave it to his mom, and we all listened to it. It was wonderful, and it played out, and we put it on the, the shelf where we have some of these pictures. And everything was fine. And then that night, Leah and Chris were in the living room having Chinese food, and my wife and I were in the bedroom just talking. And Chris yells, Mom, come here, Mom, come here, quick. And we run inside the living room, and this music box started playing all by itself at 9.41. And it stopped at 9.42. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Letters and reservations. Ever since Nikki passed in my car, I'm in my car, and, and I have an old van that I use for shows and stuff, and, and all of a sudden, my, my show I was going off, if I'm talking about Nick, or if I'm thinking about Nick, or if I'm playing any of Nick's music. By the way, Nikki took four guitar lessons in about 50 songs. <laughs> Amazing. And, and, and so we were doing this whole thing, and suddenly my windshield wipers stopped going off. <laughs> I didn't drive anywhere. I went to get some props for a show one day, and my change was 41 cents. 
Now, this is one of the things you need to know. This is their way of letting us know they're on. This is their way of letting us know there's nothing to fear. So when I got the 41 cents, I said, okay, Nick, I know that you want to Thank you, sweetheart. I love you, too. I get in my car. I'm going a beautiful day like today. I'm driving down the street. My windshield would have gone. Okay, Nick. Okay, honey, I know that, too. Honey, they're going to think I'm crazy. I'm trying. I can't shut them off. They're not on. You know what I mean? So... I finally pull into Kentucky Fried Chicken when I used to eat that. <laughs> I go into Kentucky Fried Chicken, I get a sandwich, I come back, I get the car, stop the car, I get a little witch. And out loud I say, boy, this kid won't get off my back today. And I look back like this to back up, and my real witch oil went. <laughs> Anybody go to Chili's here? Anybody go to Chili's? Speak up. Chili's back there and cheesy, it's okay. <laughs> Do you know that Chili's does not take reservations, but you can call ahead? <laughs> what the hell is that? <laughs> Don't close, we're coming. I have a friend of ours, John Land. John Land, you may know the name. He is a, he is a, a, a thriller writer. He's a very famous thriller writer. His name above the title and everything. And he, uh, that's how important he is. And, uh, but John is OCD, he's very intense. And whenever we go to Chile, we go up to the Chile something because John took Nicky's play and he made a feature length motion picture out of it. He met us and, and was so taken by the play that he expanded it. And when he expanded it, every name he put in that play, that, that, that new movie, was somebody in Nicky's life and he had no idea why he chose those. So this was John, by the way, John Land's 41st project. So we're going to go to Chili's, and he gets nervous, and he calls me. He says, did you call ahead? Did you call ahead? Yeah, John, I'll call ahead. I'll call. So I call. Now, I have to tell you that after Nikki passed, whenever we order anything, we order in Nikki's name. We go to Panera. We go to St. Nikki. We're going to pick up a pizza. We say Nikki. It's always Nikki's name. So I called Chili's, and I was very busy doing other things, and I wasn't thinking. And the woman girl said, oh, Jelly, uh, I said, okay, can you, I said, well, we're coming, three people. She said, what's the name? I said, Kane. She said, okay, and I hung up, and I went, oh, my God. If my wife finds out I didn't use Nikki's name, you know, I'm going to be sleeping on Dennis's couch, never mind mine. So I said, well, that's okay, when we get to Jelly, I'll go ahead, I'll sit in front of her children. When I walk in front, I step, but people are coming out, people are going in, and my wife got ahead of me. And my wife walked up to the girl on the podium and said, excuse me, we called ahead three people, and the girl said, three people? Oh yeah, here it is, Nikki, right? Now, I don't know how he did that, but I know it screwed me. Because now I had to tell my wife what just happened. <laughs> she was expecting to hear that, and so then I had to tell her what really happened. I don't know how they do it, but they do. One picture is worth a thousand hugs. We had a house in Cranston for a long time, and we left that house, and he was very disappointed because the boys had made a clubhouse in the attic. It was a big three-story colonial, it was gorgeous, and he had a clubhouse up in the attic. You know the nice slanted roofs and the white wall? They painted over everything. They just put signs on it. They did tic-tac-toe. They put up cartoons. They made a real museum on it, real artwork. It was unbelievable. So when he left, he was really disappointed that he couldn't bring it with him. And one morning, my wife was, was walking early in the morning and talking to Nick as she does. And she said, Nick, one of these days, maybe we'll go get that house back and we'll have everybody back and we'll go up in the attic and we'll weave in the clubhouse and we'll put up the drawings and the cartoons and the tic-tac-toe and signatures. We'll put everything up there. And then she said, I realize I can't get everybody back. And as soon as she said that, she saw on the, on the ground was a piece of that cheap art paper they give out in school, kids draw on. It was a dew-filled morning, it was a dry piece of paper. She picked it up, she turned it over, and on the other side of the paper was a picture that a young artist had drawn of a man, a woman, a boy, and a dog. And at the bottom, he signed it. Yes. Now, I don't know how they do this, but I know it happens, and I know that it's real. It was a wonderful, experience for us to know that Nikki is still checking in. 
Okay, here's a question for you. Is there anything worse than Thanksgiving with your family? <laughs> You've got people in your house you wouldn't pick up if they were hitchhiking. <laughs> there are aunts with mustaches, uncles, you don't know what the hell they are. You've got people that haven't talked to each other in a year. Ben, stand next to Judy. Judy, you sit next to Ben. Then you going to put your arms around me. Oh my God, it drives me crazy. So my wife one year said, okay, this year we're not going to go, we're not going to have everybody over, we're going to go up to Hart's Turkey Farm. Has anybody been up there? Huh? Yeah, Hart's Turkey Farm. These people sell turkey dinners. This is and Thanksgiving like a big day. So we're going to go from our house an hour and a half up to Hart's Turkey Farm. Plus an hour and a half because there was an accident on 95 that closed it down. Now I'm three hours in the car, I'm ready to go. We finally get to Hart's Turkey Farm. They got a big white tent outside, and, and, and they've they got hot uh, cider, and they got a football on the big screen. All I want to do is go in and sit down and eat. That's all I want. So we finally get in, 14 of us, two cars, right? 14, we sit down. They serve us. At the end, they give me the check. And we had made reservations at Inn at the Falls. Have you been to Inn at the Falls? Is that gorgeous? Beautiful. Waterfall going right through the hotel. It's gorgeous. It's, and in the winter, it's ice and beautiful. So we get into it at the falls, and as we're checking in, they're giving everybody a special prize that day, a special present. Guess what the present is? Free turkey dinner! <laughs> I finally get in our room, and before I, I tell you, the other thing, the other part about Thanksgiving with your family is the relative that won't put the camera down. Right? Um, yeah, we have a relative, Uncle Vito. The last time we went to Disney World, Uncle Vito took 1,100 pictures. I swear to God, his daughter graduated, but first of all, me in front of the castle, my wife in front of the castle, me and my wife in front of the castle. My wife on the left side, my wife on the right. 1,100 pictures. When his daughter graduated from high school, he took 600 pictures. He was taking pictures of other people's families. Hey, here's my email address. Call me, I'll send it to you. He was going everywhere. So we get in our room, and Vito comes in with his camera, and he takes a picture of us in the room now. The, uh, the one on the right is my wife or my daughter, depending on how you look at it. Uh, the young lady is, uh, is her niece, and, uh, and, and the legs that you see next to her is her brother. She's walking with a coat. And the guy in the bed, you might recognize. By the way, this is what I look like when I'm standing up. <laughs> now, there's somebody else in that picture. Would you like to tell me if you see the other person in that picture? Speak right up. Anybody? Behind my wife. Let me go back for you. Now at the bottom you can see her, her sweater, her blue sweater, you can see the shadow on the duvet. But below that are black pants. And behind her, of course, is the sweater. That figure is the height, weight, and size. Okay. Happy Thanksgiving, Mom. Enjoy this day. Okay, I have one more story for you. I hope I've been very um, uplifting to you. I hope I've been hopeful to you. I hope that you realize that. Thank you. I hope that you realize that your loved ones have gone nowhere, that they are here, that they are around you. They're not up there, we're looking down, they're right here. Somebody ate my cake while I was here. They love you and they're with you. And I'm glad that I've been hopeful to you, but I also want to admit something to you. Losing Nikki was the most horrible event in my life. I couldn't breathe. I was sobbing. I was screaming. The following morning, I stood in the mirror in the bathroom. You know, I had been a, a talk show host for almost 40 years. I knew the answers to 
everything, especially stuff I knew nothing about. And here I was standing, screaming to myself, okay, big shot, okay, wise guy, now what do you know? You tell me what you know, you big jerk. I couldn't breathe. But it was worse for my wife. Nikki's mom was near comatose. I had, to, I had to lead her around. I had to remind her to do things. I had to just say, you know, this is just terrible. And the thing that drove her crazy the most was her fear that Nikki suffered in the blaze, and he felt the flames. It drove her crazy. Well, every medium we went to said to us, no pain. That was the phrase they used, no pain. When we asked them, they'd say, no pain. When I didn't ask, they still say, no pain. Well, about seven years ago, we were tagging at Christmas tree, and they loved doing that, we were tagging at Christmas tree, and, and my wife was in that mode, worrying that he suffered. And being the kind, gentle, loving husband that I am, I was screaming at him. What is the matter with you? When are you going to get it? How many times is this kid going to tell you? Every medium we've been to has said, no pain. They didn't even know what each other said. No pain. No pain. We get in the car. She's driving. And we're going up the hill after we leave the Christmas tree farm. And I say to her, what do you want him to do? Put it in writing? And as soon as I said that, a car coming from the other direction had a vanity plate. No pain. Now, now far away, they're with us now and always. Just as you would not leave them, they are not leaving you. Death is nothing at all. I have only slipped into the next room. I am I, and you are you. Whatever we were to each other, that we still are. Call me by my old familiar name. Speak to me in an easy way, which you always use. Put no difference in your tone. Wear no forced air of solemnity in your sorrow. Nothing is past, nothing is lost. One brief moment in all will be as it ever was before. How we shall laugh at the trouble of party when we meet again. Henry Scott Holland wrote this, he lived from 1847 to 1918. He was again in St. Paul's Cathedral in England. He knew then what I know now, that there is nothing to fear, that your loved ones are with you always. At the end of Nikki's play, they walk among us, Grace the angel says to the boy they're trying to help, in the end, everything, and I do mean everything, is going to be just fine. And the last line of the play is, do not fear at all. So we put that on the easy stone. And when we visit, we look at it, and when we leave, my wife says, okay, come on, Google, and he leaves with us. I hope you enjoyed this. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you.